talk about heart failure. Uh, we're going to learn two main diseases of the heart in this class, and you'll have a lot more pathophysiology as you move along in your career. The two heart conditions we're going to talk about are heart failure and angina. When you're first learning new diseases of the heart, it can be confusing which one is which. But I'll just tell you right now, in heart failure, the problem is that the heart is too weak to pump the blood around the body. So the body's not getting enough oxygen. Uh, and because it's so weak, fluid backs up into various parts of your body. In contrast, in angina, the blood vessels are too thin, in or and so the heart isn't getting enough blood and the oxygen, etc. And angina is a precursor to a MI, or a heart attack. All right, so this in this video, I just want to talk about heart failure. In the heart anatomy little video, I mentioned cardiac output and stroke volume. In heart failure, there's another term that we use called ejection fraction. So what ejection fraction is just measuring is how much of the blood that's in the ventricle is actually getting squirted out with each stroke. So uh, normally every time your left ventricle squeezes, it gets maybe three quarters of the blood out. You know, so you'd say that was a 75% ejection fraction. Um, as the heart becomes weaker, with each stroke, it's hard, you know, it, it gets harder and harder to actually pump blood into the body. So the ejection fraction would drop. Once your ejection fraction is below like 50%, um, then you might start seeing symptoms of heart failure. Okay, so let's talk about what happens with heart failure. Heart failure is the situation in which the heart cannot pump enough blood to your body. So in most cases, that's because the heart is too weak. What I'd like to do right now is focus on one particular situation of heart failure, namely left-sided heart failure following a heart attack that has affected the left ventricle. Let's imagine that we have a patient who just had a heart attack in the last year, and part of the heart wall, the left ventricle, is damaged and scarred. Remember, the heart is very efficient, so when you have a scarred portion of the heart, it means that the heart is not going to pump as well as it used to. Now, when we talk about heart failure, we think about three main things. First, we think about something called preload, which is basically the blood volume, particularly the blood volume in your veins. Your body measures how much blood is in your system in a variety of ways, including stretch receptors that are in the right atrium and are in the vena cava as well as osmolarity sensors in your brain and your kidney. So preload is going to be veins and volume. The second thing we worry about is something called afterload, which is the pressure against which the heart has to beat, namely the pressure in the aorta. So imagine that even when the heart is not actively squeezing, there's still quite a high pressure in that aorta, and every time the heart beats, it has to squeeze against that pressure. It's like trying to walk upstream in a fast-flowing river. That pressure in the aorta is basically the pressure in the arteries. So pressure in the arteries is afterload. That's going to be a problem, too. The third main issue in heart failure is the contractility, or the strength of contraction of the heart. So that's another thing to worry about. All right, let's imagine we have this patient with their weak left ventricle. Just thinking about the pump, the heart is a pump, as if it were the pump of, that pumped water around your house. If the pump starts not working, you get backup of water, right, because the water can't go through. If the left ventricle is the problem, then fluid that backs up is going to back up into the lungs, right? And when fluid backs up into blood vessels in the lungs, that blood has nowhere to go. It's backed up, it can't go forward, it can't go back. So what happens is the fluid portion of the blood, the plasma, or I like to think of it as the human juice, freshly squeezed, that juice, that plasma, starts oozing out of the capillaries and into the surrounding tissues. Now when your lungs fill with fluid, it's bad because no matter how much oxygen you breathe, if your lungs are filled with water, you cannot breathe and you die, right? That situation is called pulmonary edema, pulmonary for lung, edema for swelling. And you can actually hear the level of the water with a stethoscope because you can hear the air bubbling through the water. That's called crackles or RALS, R-A-L-E-S. Okay, so that backup, that's preload. So that's, I think, the most easy concept is this idea of the fluid backing up. All right, now let's think about cardiac output. 
if the heart is too weak, if part of the left ventricle's wall is scarred and doesn't work, the ejection fraction drops and the cardiac output drops. If the cardiac output drops, it means that less blood is getting pumped to the body, and in particular, the kidneys. Now, the kidneys are, have a way, if you remember, the juxtaglomerular apparatus, do you remember that? Uh, the kidneys have a way of figuring out how much figuring out what the blood pressure is. Is there enough blood pressure? You also have baroreceptors, pressure receptors, in your aorta and your carotids, right? All right. So the kidney realizes the pressure is going down. Pressure can't go down because if the pressure goes down, you pass out, lines eat you, and then the kidney has nothing to do. So the kidney and baroreceptors send out signals saying we need to increase the blood pressure. The first thing that happens is sympathetic nervous output, right? So we get sympathetic nervous output, which increases the vasoconstriction of most of the blood vessels in your body, right? That's through alpha-1 receptors. You also get beta-1 stimulation of the heart rate and increasing contractility. Now, increasing contractility means that the heart beats more strongly, which is what you want, but you don't necessarily want it to beat faster because if it starts to beat too fast, the ejection fraction drops. There are also beta-1 receptors in the kidney, and they stimulate the production of renin. Renin pr promotes the production of angiotensin and activated angiotensin. That occurs in the lungs, which is sort of a side issue. The activated angiotensin is its own vasoconstrictor working through its own angiotensin receptors. Nothing to do with the sympathetic receptors. Angiotensin, in turn, increases the amount of aldosterone and ADH. Aldosterone and ADH both increase fluid retention and that increases blood volume. So by having a drop in cardiac output, you have an increase in afterload due to the vasoconstriction of uh, blood vessels from angiotensin and alpha-1 receptors. And you also have an increase in preload due to the stimulation of ADH uh, and aldosterone. Increase in the amount of fluid we retain, which increases blood volume. And when you have extra blood volume, it hangs out in your veins because arteries can constrict and dilate pretty strongly, but veins are kind of floppy. So when you have extra fluid, it just all hangs out in your veins. If they have bad enough heart failure that the fluid backs up not only in their lungs, but in the rest of their body, and the fluid backs up in the vena cava, you can actually see the, the fluid backed up in the jugular vein and that fluid level rises or falls depending on whether the patient is sitting up straight or laying down, which is a really helpful diagnostic sign that you can see without any instruments at all. Another sequela of having this increased volume coming into the, in this case, left atrium, is that all the fluid like tries to rush into the left atrium and it stretches the heart. I think of it uh, preload as being sort of like the Walmart shoppers on Black Friday after Thanksgiving. You know, there's always people that get crushed to death because they're all trying to squeeze into Walmart. And I think of the preload, the fluid just trying desperately to get into the heart, and it stretches the heart. Now the heart is made of cardiac muscle cells, and just like skeletal muscle cells, those muscle cells have an optimal length at which they work best. And that's because at an optimal length. The actin and myosin overlap just right so that you get very efficient contraction. If the heart gets stretched, the actin and myosin don't overlap properly and so they, they can't constrict as well as they could. That stretching you can actually see on an x-ray. Once you've seen a bunch of x-rays you'll get used to what the heart should look like, about how big it should be. And in a patient with heart failure, a lot of times you'll see this cardiomegaly. It's just the heart being all stretched all the heck um, so that it can't beat strongly anymore. If you have right-sided heart failure, like maybe you had a heart attack in the right ventricle, then the fluid backs up into the body. And that manifests as swelling or edema in the body. Now, that, that fluid is going to fall with gravity. So if you have a patient who stands up all day and they've got heart failure, they're going to get swelling in their ankles. And the swelling in the tissues can be so bad that if you stick your finger into the tissues, you like poke their leg, when you pull out your finger, it will retain the shape of your finger. Now, that's not something you do to patients because it's fun, although it is quite interesting to look at. Um, it's because that's a diagnostic sign called pitting edema. 
Now, severe left-sided heart failure, usually over time, the fluid's backed up to the lungs, and then it backs up into the right heart, and then it backs up into the body. So you can have somebody who perhaps has heart failure because of a left ventricular injury, um, but they may display some of these right-sided heart failure signs just because over time the fluid has just continued to back up. What we're going to do with medications is we're going to try to reduce afterload, that is reduce the pressure in the arteries. We're going to reduce preload, usually by reducing the blood volume, the amount of fluid into the person. And then we're going to try to make the heart more efficiently pump. And uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about digoxin's role in doing this just because I think that's a uh, easy way to think about increasing contractility in the heart. Uh, one last thing in class, we're going to talk about chronic and acute heart failure. Chronic heart failure is sort of this slow process in which fluid is backing up. Acute heart failure is when suddenly the heart failure gets bad enough that the lungs just fill with fluid very quickly. And in that situation, obviously, you have to get you have to fix the patient within a very short amount of time because uh, otherwise they sort of drown in their own fluids. All right, so now we've talked about heart failure and some of the causes, left versus right heart failure, mentioned the term ejection fraction. And what I'd like to do now is talk about some of the drug classes that we use for heart failure. So that'll be our next lecture in class. Okay?